and welcome to tonight's three guests, Julie Morrissey, Musa Wenkosi Kanyile, and Ellen Hinsey. So I'm going to introduce each poet in order, in that order. Uh, then we'll have a reading from each poet and we'll end the session with a few questions uh, for each poet as well. And if you'd like to know more about each of our readers tonight or any of the other readers and all the other events that are happening during this festival, you can check out uh, ovale.ie forward slash winter warmer. That's where the festival stage is located. I will introduce our first guest, Julie Morrissey. Uh, Julie is an Irish poet, academic, critic and activist and she's coming to us tonight from Dublin in Ireland. Um, she's the inaugural John Pollard Newman Fellow in Creativity at UCD and she teaches creative writing there as well. Uh, she's also a recipient of the Next Generation Artist Award from the Arts Council and her debut collection Where the Mile End is published by Bookhug in Canada and by Tall Lighthouse in the UK. So welcome Julie. Thanks so much, Cathy, uh, for the introduction. And I'm um, really, really happy to be part of uh, this virtual event for Avail. Um, I really have loved winter warmers for a long time. So I'm very happy to be in tonight's lineup. And I'm looking forward to enjoying more poetry in the next few days. Um, so a big thank you to everyone that um, organized tonight. I know that it's very challenging these days. And um, it's great. Great to be here, as as Cathy said, um, joining you from Dublin. So I'm going to begin um, with my book that came out last year. And I'm gonna start with the kind of um, title poem, I guess. Um, I read in a festival at the weekend in Ottawa called Verse Fest. And for that festival, um, Gilles Latour translated this poem for me into French. So I thought I'd read it in French and then follow it with English. Le Mile End. Cet avril-là, nous nous sommes perdus au Québec, quand nous étions en Courtois. Nous nous sommes aventurés assez loin sur les fifés chemins, passés devant des granges et des turbines et des citernes en métal, avec des champs partout. Nous nous sommes perdus au Québec, et nous le savions. Personne à qui demander des directions. Même si l'un d'entre nous était Québécois, copilote sur la banquette arrière, mais elle ne le savait pas. Nous étions perdus à Dublin aussi, sans elle. Nous sommes toutes deux de cette ville. Ce voyage en voiture avait quelque chose d'étrange. Où était-ce plutôt au Vermont? Où nous l'avions croisé par hasard en pleine tempête de neige à Burlington? Souviens-toi. Cette équipe de basket descendue à l'hôtel, la piscine pleine d'hommes très grands. Il a fallu dégager l'auto, rester prise dans la neige tout à terre, les rues vers l'intérieur ou dans le sein contraire, où je ne me souviens plus comment conduire dans la neige. Nous avons erré ensemble à travers le Québec quelques fois encore un peu moins perdu. Je devrais aller vers la chaleur la prochaine fois, mais les insectes. Et si je suis seul, je ne peux pas appeler un voisin pour tuer les araignées. Je pourrais peut-être vivre dans un nouvel édifice, un appartement scalé, peut-être un de ceux dont les fenêtres n'ouvrent pas, une capsule avec toutes les chaînes à la télé. Et quand arriverai le dimanche de Super Bowl, je pourrai inviter des gens avec de la bière et du party mix. Et je donnerai un coup de fil à la maison pour leur raconter les pubs. Mettre les bouteilles au recyclage, marcher jusqu'au dépanneur, faire du ménage, lire, regarder Sex in the City, laver la vaisselle, probablement deux assiettes seulement et un matelas roulé. Magasiner dans les boutiques situées le long du trajet en bus. Éviter d'acheter des livres. Trouver le meilleur forfait cellulaire. Aspirer l'air qui se réchauffe. Et songer à la bienvenue exagérée quand on me réserve ici. Donc, 
the myland that april we got lost in quebec quand nous étions en courtois drove out pretty far on those orange roads past barns and turbines and metal tanks fields everywhere we got lost in quebec and we knew we were lost there was nobody to ask even though one of us was quebecois backseat driver but she didn't know we were lost in dublin too without her we are both from this town there was something about that car trip, or am I thinking of Vermont, when we ran into her by chance in the middle of a snowstorm in Burlington. Remember, that basketball team were staying at the hotel, the pool brimming with tall men and snow all around, digging the car out, turning tires inward or against, or I can't remember how to drive in snow. We roamed around Quebec a few more times together, a little less lost. I should go for heat next time, but the bugs. And if I'm alone, can't call a neighbour to kill spiders. Maybe I can live in a new build, a sealed off apartment, maybe even one where the windows don't open, a capsule and all the channels on the TV. And when Super Bowl Sunday comes, I can have people around for beer and party mix. And I'll call home, tell them about the ads. Recycle the bottles, walk to the store, clean up, read, watch Sex in the City, wash the dishes, probably only two plates and a roll up mattress. Shop wherever is on the bus route, avoid buying books, find the best phone plan. Breathe in the calescent air and think about how grossly welcome I am there. So I'm going to stay with the book and stay in Canada. This is other half. I used to swim and swim and swim over archways, under tunnels. Blue nights and days clawed through my dreams, toes pressed poolside, pushed through stinging metal flat palm door, clip-clop of flip-flop. Undressed in 6 a.m. darkness, pull the wool over my eyes, stretch like her suit, slide up legs, breasts in place, straps on shoulders. I used to swim, religious, raised elbows, dashing forearms, plunge and plunge and plunge again, the second clock, the smell. I spent the days alone, minutes in water, eardrums echoing, frozen in time and structure, like my leg as it rose, straight, quick whip-kicked barrel, wet hair spiking the root home where I closed the internal door behind me on Admiral Road in the hexagon apartment with two double beds, windows everywhere, snow outside, inside the murmur of the fridge. Coming back to Dublin for this one and the next one. False positive. It is one of those evenings in a slightly too hot function room on the first floor of a Georgian building overlooking a Dublin park. Everyone here is a high achiever. Not business card high achievers, but definitely a bunch of big brains. One esteemed colleague introduces another, and I wonder how I can slip my name onto that chain letter. I make sure not to lean on one knee, even out my hips, nod at the references. I know I've seen the photo league somewhere. Everyone in this room is bigger than me. The not quite beige, not quite mustard carpet boasts indentation from years of use. Dozens, 
No hundreds of applause-filled evenings, incisive Q&As. Little grooves where chairs pressed in and one outstanding red wine stain sprawling in front of my feet, almost black. A CT scan with shadows and the heat in the room peaks. The line. My hands move either miles ahead or miles behind my brain. Maybe it began with lead marks on craft paper at a desk somewhere, in school or at home, before my attention turned a quick swift, a quick switch and click. My pupils migrate to the sides of my eyes, catching a glimpse of a frill just outside my vision, learning by accessing things I already know. If I shake my head hard enough, they'll slip out onto the page. Like the day I picked up a pencil and sat, stretching my brain into downward dog, then plow pose, then feathered peacock. Nowadays, I rifle through drawers at my parents' house, filled with used corks, lemon reamers, spaghetti spoons, throwing open each cupboard door on a never-ending search for the rehomed sugar. I turn handles. I know approximate locations. Somewhere here, in the space between the oven and the new French doors. So I'm going to move on to a different project now. Um, I'm working on a few different things at the moment, but one um, project is called Certain Individual Women. I've been working on it for a long time. Um, and it's a book line poem that has three parts. Um, one part is lyric poems about myself and my own experiences. Uh, another part is uh, our lyric poems about my grandmother who was born in Ravensdale, um, just near the border of North and South and County Louds in 1921. And she went to work in Belfast um, in the 40s. And the third part is um, about legal language um, and looks at parts of uh, the Irish constitution and legislation, drawing back to a, a time when I studied law, I suppose. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to start with um, one of the poems about my grandmother, Fra, um, was published this year, um, I think this year, um, yeah, by Colette Rice in, in Poetry Ireland Review. The Democrat, 1944. The McGee's held a unique position, like superheroes with daddy holding the keys to Waterworks House, the only man in town with a telephone. Born after his father died, he had the cure for whooping cough. He was the man who could put out fires, turn on the taps, make it flow, give life to a village or a child. Fra didn't lick it off the stones. When she came home with the clipping from the Democrat, folded tightly in her purse, meticulous, sharp corners, like how she amassed wrapping paper on Christmas Day, an eco-heroine before her time. Daddy laughed, a sound so convivial, his whole body jerked and tumbled, bemused at his daughter's naivety, her ambition. The bearer has been in our employment as secretary for over three years. We feel confident she will fill any position of trust. Didn't she know they weren't that desperate? Didn't she know that young women from the South wouldn't be brought up to the posh offices of the Great Northern Railway with the managers, the station masters, the clerks? The bearer was employed as bookkeeper, shorthand and typewriting, during which time I found her studious and efficient, trustworthy and honest. She leaves me of her own free will. Fra drew a long breath and smiled, hugged her father, 
Christ unfolded the advert back into her pocket. She stepped away from the kitchen table at Drumnasilla, a slight skip in her step, an unnoticed raised eyebrow. September 13th, 1944, Fra moved to Belfast. She left of her own free will. Proposal. What I'm thinking is the summer, no rings. I'm thinking in the summer, yellow dress, not location, but maybe away. I'm thinking bottles of wine and pasta and photos, a fun time, no rings, but we can smile. And in the end, I'm thinking, what's the difference? An upstyle, glossy makeup, no rings as long as we can dress up and eat cake. What I'm thinking is a ferry trip, but casual, no rings. And I already have the shoes. And with no rings, it will be summer. And I imagine myself in that yellow dress I saw in Saks Fifth Avenue 17 years ago, before I was thinking about any of this. Civil Regulations Amendment Act 1956, Retirement of Women civil, civil Servants on Marriage. Women holding positions in the civil service other than positions which are declared accepted positions under subsection two of this section are required to retire upon marriage. The minister may from time to time declare any particular positions, not being established positions or a class of positions to be accepted positions for the purpose of subsection one of this section. Hold women, physician women, service women, other women, declare women, accept women, require women, establish women, retire women, purpose women, section women, the minister holds women in subpositions, positions women in marriage. The minister, others women, declares women for service. The minister retires women for other purposes, purposes women to marriage, establishes services, service positions for women. Women from, women of, women upon, women for, women to, women in. Women hold, women position, women declare, women require, women establish. May women declare positions other than service. May women declare positions other than marriage. May women be accepted from being civil. Minister, may we? So I'm gonna finish with two poems. Um, for kind of newer projects and uh, one is a really really short poem and it's from a new publication I have coming out soon um, which looks like this uh, it's called performances in all directions that's the name of the booklet um, and it starts with a really tiny poem that I'm going to read before my last poem even now some days I look up for a split second. The sky is still there, dusty yellow, ubiquitous high. My last poem uh, appeared in the Irish Times as poem of the week earlier this year. So I'm going to finish with this one. Thank you very much for listening. Really excited about the next readings. Rental. There's nothing we can do about the carpet. Rows of straight lines turned to furry clumps. Cats scratching and the dogs paws. We return from a trip. The bang of mold in the bedroom, clothes slowly rotting in wardrobes, clotted with tie-dye spores. And it's freezing in the winter. So we cover the carpets with rugs, 
and new fittings for the cupboards. Small, round, ceramic, blue and white, a different pattern on each. I leave them wrapped in brown paper on the kitchen counter. The next afternoon, arrive home to new blue paradise replacement. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julie. Uh, I'm going to clap for you because it's so strange that you're not going to get the um, the applause of the audience who I'm sure were really happy to be here. Uh, that was an excellent reading. I'm going to introduce our second reader now. Um, Musa Kanyile is a South African poet and clinical psycholo psychologist from KwaZulu-Natal um, and he's currently based in Cape Town, South Africa and that's where he's coming to us from tonight. His debut collection, All the Places, was shortlisted for the 2020 Ingrid Jonker Prize and has just recently been announced as a co-winner of the 2020 South African Literary Award for Poetry. Uh, his chapbook, The Internal Saboteur, was published by Akashic Books in collaboration with the African Poetry Book Fund as part of the 2019 New Generation African Poets Chapbook Box Set, CETA. So welcome, Musa. Thank you. Thank you so much. What, what an absolute honor to read uh, in, in such an amazing uh, poetry festival. Um, I, I don't have the words. I'm, I'm, I'm very honored. And, and that was such a beautiful reading by Julie. Um, and I look forward to uh, hearing more. Uh, uh, so let me start off with a poem entitled Introduction, uh, because uh, I think it, it's fitting to start with. Introduction. I'm a poet living in a country where poetry books hardly make shelves because they are bad business. Now in my twenties, I'm still to meet someone like me who sleeps with a poetry book upon their chest. I didn't want to choose happiness over breath and have my children hate me for pretending words can fill up stomachs. So I studied psychology all the way up to masters. It felt like betrayal at times, some days as cold as beds of those who never followed in their hearts. But I needed breakfast. Dry lit smiles tell more than one tale. The other tale wakes men at dawn. They'll do anything to chase it from their lips. Bodies must suffer if needs be. I place a lid of hope over my evaporating dreams. Now they are slowly becoming water to quench my thirst of page and stage. I had to find breakfast. It is hard to imagine happiness in a slanting shell, even if they tell you it does live there. It is hard. I'm going to read a few poems from my chapbook and entitled to the internal subjector. Uh, we'll read just a few poems and then uh, also read uh, a few poems from my debut collection of poems entitled All the Places. The internal, the, the internal subjector. In grade eight, my hand landed on the delicate parts of a classmate. This did not look anything like me a well-behaved boy who always wore neatly and performed well in class. She reported me. One teacher said I needed to cut down on cheese. Back home, there was only my father, a man who lived within himself. We turned the house into separate homes. Our hearts never came out of our rooms. We met briefly on our coincidental walks to the kitchen and also in the lounge when Soka was playing on TV. That is the only time we ever spoke. Even when we drove a distance, we listened to the humming of the engine. I learned to store his voice within me for the silent days, like ants store food ahead of winter. 
Mom had gone to live in a rural area, in a house that dad built on the conviction that men should retire away from the restlessness of the township. She'd taken my younger siblings with her. I was in primary school. Mom raised me with a loud voice and a short temper. I remember, me, I remember her pressing me against the ground, hitting me with all the energy she possessed. I swung back and forth from loving to hating to tolerating her. A part of me was happy when she left. Now she calls to complain that I never call. I grew up in solitude, learned to enjoy silence, got used to keeping myself to myself, found poetry in high school and hid myself there. Girls came and went. Relationships slipped through my hands. Maybe because I never learned to share myself. Maybe because of mom and dad and silence. The psychologist in, in Hilton asked me, who then taught you affection? And then scribbled down a note when I couldn't answer. That was the last time I saw her. In the beginning. In the beginning, there was a mother who loved me the best way she knew how. In the beginning, there was a father who loved me the best way he knew how. The mother only knew to love with a loud voice. The father only knew to love with silence. Now there is a man, shredded from the beginning, who can't find the balance between say and not say. For days I keep how much I love you inside myself and you blame me for keeping quiet. I don't know what's enough. In the Bible, a man begged for the drop of water to be placed on his tongue. Burning with love, I looked at you and thought, that was enough. You turn and say, I live too much inside myself, leaving you all alone outside. In my dreams, you have your head resting on my chest and are satisfied. There are many rooms inside myself. Find the one you're comfortable in. Shut the door behind you. I'm already inside. All right, so let me now read poems from my debut collection um, for the places which uh, recently won the South African Literary Award for Poetry in English came as a huge surprise. Um, and I'm so grateful to uh, Kobus uh, Mulmen, who read recently uh, for supervising me uh, while I was doing Masters in Creative Writing. Uh, this is when I worked on, on this book, on this project. I've divided the poems into three chapters because the book is divided into three chapters. I'll start with the rural and move on to the township and then I'll finish off with the, with the urban. A school visit. I remember how the drizzle came when I least expected it. Even the sun was caught off guard because it didn't move. The heat rose from the pores of the soil when the drops fell, and children in school uniform ran for shelter. I was introduced, class by class, as an important guest. I tried to put on the face of someone who's figured out this life thing, attempting the walk of those who know where their lives are going. Every class had a window with a hole in it, a broken desk, and something wrong with the door. In the class without a door, I took the exercise book of a little girl who smelled of paraffin and looked at the tree she had drawn, a leafless tree with no bird in it. She had a beautiful smile with a missing tooth. She said, Doctor, speaking out saliva, when I asked her what she wanted to be when she grew up. 
Habeni. It's one of my favorite poems, I guess. I don't know if it's it's advisable to have a favorite poem. Uh, you learn to tell the direction of the wind during your walks by the side of the gravel road, and that streams are running taps where a cow and a boy might come to drink at the same time. You also learn that a girl's hips are a good resting place for your hands, and that kissing her for a long time by the river leaves you with memories that remain long after she is no more. Shoved against a wall by an angry boyfriend years later to die in a government hospital. And since her name was Novula, you remember that one day on the mountain you saw the rain coming and outran it. But nobody believed that you could outrun the rain. song in my heart. My girlfriend and I fight because I haven't yet mastered the art of bathing in a dish. Water spills all over the floor when I reach for my armpits. She complains that I complain about this tiny room where we hear kettles boiling next door and neighbors yawning as they wake up. But I always return to drown our love making with Ukozi FM. It takes me three hours on a taxi to get to her. The song in my heart keeps me company. I'll read a few poems uh, in the township section. Find the truth uh, for the more. You know what it was like. I drove, I left to the dining room floor and graduated to a bed after our sister left for varsity. You know the roughness of our hands and the fierceness of the sun. You took the wheelbarrow from me when you were strong enough to fetch the crates of cold drinks for our little family business all the way to the taxi rank in the salon where our mother played stock fell. What I want you to know now is that there isn't much truth in the township. It crumbles like bread on the table. In schools, children smile for a 40%. In success is a golf GTI park next to a tiny house. Brothers measure their success in whiskey bottles and brush their big bellies in taverns. Sisters fall in love with front seats and wear off in the streets like car tires. You know what the township is like. It's a victory to rise above all this, to survive the streets that gush out blood and open up into graves, and even more to move out of the township to places where mornings come with a sea breeze, where people do not live in the smell of poverty. Poverty has filled our nostrils. We know the stench of unflushable trellis and shacks that tell the tale of a man's suffering. Do not forget the privilege of having been close enough. A man can only run away from what he knows. Find the truth. Do not forget our dining room floor. And don't you dare drive a car that's worth more than where you sleep. Getting a bit worried that I might be reading too fast. Um, I'm now in the, in the last section, uh, but I, I guess I, I can always read from the book. Outside KFC, he cannot escape the cracking voice of a boy with a thin arm stretched out to him. Outside KFC, who eyes the brown packet in his hand and begs, please, booty, please.
dissemination. Something was made when you made love, something we were not ready for. So you called, panicking, telling me about the test, asking that you need. I rose from the bed and put on my jacket, my heart coming out of my mouth. It will take only two days after this to find myself waiting for you. Paterson Street, Newcastle, in broad daylight. Two women, one pregnant, crossed the street as if to remind me. God sees everything. Before this, we were on the road. You said I was a mess, but you would marry me. And I remembered that I had loved you since childhood. You would be more than an hour inside the surgery, and I would keep the, the engine running the whole time, like a man ready to take off after a crime. To the bus stop. It is drizzling, and I'm walking next to a woman who drew our future with her finger on my chest last night. She's holding a small umbrella beneath which only she can fit. She has been calling me to join her, willing to sacrifice half of herself to the wetness. I refuse. Just before we come to the mall, the white Audi A3 lowers its speed to match ours. A young man in the passenger seat holding a dumpy calls for her, for her t attention. He's asking to talk to her, asking for her number, complimenting her legs. I stare at him to assure him that I exist. He keeps trying to talk to her, unaffected by my cold eyes. I keep my words inside me. I tell myself it will soon be over. He gives up. The car speeds off and disappears around the corner. I point ahead to the bus stop and tell my woman our bus has arrived. Thames Bay. We drove up the road in a rented fiesta, leaving Thames Bay behind us. I'd found a back room where the rich live and couldn't sleep alone. You asked me to pull up at the side of the road so I could take pictures of you with the mountain in the background, even though you, unlike me, grew up in the city. I said, imagine being stunned by the beauty of a lover like this, 20 years later. You smiled and said, don't be a poet now putting me close enough to feel your nipples pressing against my chest, even though you, unlike me, were somebody's fiancé. The world opens up. The world opens up like a flower, but much more beautifully. I am telling you this because the township walled us in. In the township, you carve your way out like a prisoner committed to an escape plan. I'm on this side of the rainbow now, where the world is generous with itself. Sometimes I go to the beach and wonder why waves call me at their most aggressive. What are the side effects of surviving the township? Why do I dream of someone plunging a knife into my chest? I take nothing for granted. Even this bed, this full fridge, this breath. Once there was a bed with bricks for legs. Once there was a hole 
in the other way. I remind myself of such things to remain humble. I don't forget to leave. In the lift, I start to strangers by merely greeting them. Will hardware not level the ground for us? I sit at the table with people who don't know leaking ropes, and the waiter hands each of us the same menu. From my office window, I see cars speeding on the highway and think how awesome it would be, brother, to drive with our arms stretched out like wings, the air fanning us, brushing against our black skin. Who would tell that I left to a dining room floor to sleep on? Thank you. I'll, I'll end here. I'll end here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Masa. Uh, there's clapping for you on behalf of all of the virtual audience. Um, I just, I felt very, I felt so many emotions while you were reading and I was thinking particularly about how I'm here on the border of the Arctic in Iceland and you're in one of the southernmost places in the world and I was able to listen to you read your poetry live and I'm just very grateful for that, so thank you. Uh, now we're going to Paris in France, I feel like I'm presenting the Eurovision, uh, to Ellen Hinsey, who is a journalist uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, and she's the author of eight books of poetry, essays, dialogue and literary translations. And her most recent volume of poetry, The Illegal Age, explores the rise of authoritarianism and was the Poetry Book Society's 2018 Autumn Choice. Um, Ellen is also part of Ovale's partnership with ARC Publications. She's one of four poets who were at this year's festival as part of this ongoing partnership. So welcome, Ellen. Good evening. Um, it's a great honor to be here at the in for the Cork Festival, virtually. And I'd like to thank Paul Casey for inviting me and also for our publications, for their commitment to international literature, which fosters dialogue across borders. Um, as the other wonderful poets this evening have been describing, we're living in difficult times. This is not just this year's pandemic, but over the last half decade, or even the last decade, we don't know exactly where to draw the line. I think many people have begun to feel that there's been a shift with regard to civic life, politics, and, and the natural world. I'm going to read a number of poems tonight that address this. The title of my ro most recent book, The Illegal Age, is a response to what was once called the age of anxiety, this phrase that was uh, associated with Auden. And my feeling is that this period of time, uh, the post-war period, the post-89 period, has come to an end. And we've now entered an, a different, uncertain time, um, a darker period, a more dangerous period, um, and perhaps, if we're not careful, an illegal age. But thankfully, there's also a lot of resistance to this. Um, part of this new age seems to be that many of the things we once took for granted, whether they're civic things, social things, relationships between people, um, are being eroded. And we even find sometimes uh, asking ourselves simple questions again, because our sense of, um, of what we could take for granted no, is no longer stable. Sometimes we find ourselves asking basic questions like, weren't we supposed to care first about others? Or weren't we supposed to put charity before individual gain? Those old simple questions, and we doubt our own perceptions. The first poem I'm going to read tonight deals with questions that I have been recently asking myself. It's a new poem. It's called Inquiry. Tonight, there are two or three things I'd like clarified. Why does it seem language has now been occupied, overtaken by a foreign tongue? Why do common days of the week press ever closer together, like strangers bracing before a storm? Why does the wind now avoid the borders? Why do the weeds grow ever closer to the graves? Where have they hidden 
the forbidden orders, the ones they cross out before you wake? Why do those men keenly prospect the hour as if tracking it with a marksman's eye? Why does it seem the interval has now closed, the uncertain episode arrived? Why do the disappearances come now at rhythmic intervals as if someone could monitor grief's intimate pulse? Why do the station's loudspeakers emit that uncertain noise, the one that precedes the dark announcement? Why are even these few simple questions removed by the question marks tight noose? Listen, it is as if you can again hear the engines running, headlights of the black vehicles left on, facing the dark of pines after midnight. These are some of my questions, not all of them, but they're listening as I type. The next poem I'm going to read is dedicated to the free press, who I think have done an incredible job and who are truly an integral part of the democratic spirit. This poem deals with, which is from the illegal age, deals with the necessary task of finding evidence. It's called Handbook of Smoke, and I'd like to read it tonight, uh, dedicate it tonight to the Irish journalist and writer, Susan McKay who spent her life looking and, and serving justice. Handbook of Smoke. You can construct it on frozen earth, erect it from split wood and strung wire. You can decree a location next to a forest, beyond the close hearing of a town. You can implant rustic barracks and rows shackle them in a tight grid. You can erect in each corner a tower spider, dig the harsh terrain for simple latrines. You do not need nature's forgiveness, you only need its mute complicity. You can receive the rust-burdened trains, you can assemble the thirst-afflicted bodies, you can then do what will never be able to be described in language. From each mouth, you can erase the sacred vowel lodged at the base of speech. In black retreat, you can then tear down the smoke-consumed towers. You can empty the silence oppressed barracks. You can disperse the torn identity papers. You can hastily sow the fields with young poplars. Despite how clean the end is, see how much can still be traced. I think that's one of the things that we've learned is that no matter how much people try, it's possible to also uncover the truth. And that's part of one of the tools we have. Um, I, over 120 years ago, in November 1898, the poet Konstantin Kavafi reflected on the state. And I, I began to wonder recently what future historians might say about this period that we're living through. The next poem is a dialogue in some future time between a citizen and a historian set in the classical world and in our own time. And it's called The Dark Annals. And it has a, a small uh, quote by Livy that begins it, which says, by a secret oath to keep forever the power they had acquired. Later, my historian dutifully inscribed in the dark annals, that year men gathered in private councils among themselves. It will be refuted they had a mandate but from the lamenting mouths of the ancient urns will come the ascent they did. It will re be remembered they first emptied the granite squares, then swung wide the city gates for those rough bands who always wait at logic's outskirts. That they made a fool of the laws, 
how in the Senate, with garlands closely sewn on their heads, they gave false witness, but the others, as if entranced, forbore uprising against them. It will be recalled it was in the summer that the fierce heat of the sun was upon them, that under the vast eyeless sky, they watched as the innocents were taken from oaken carts, the young separated from their elders, that a silent purge began, that doubt decimated the already dry fields. It will be said, some desire to cry out, but fearful they will declare their mouths were already sealed with the frozen wax of alarm. Others will whisper, remember, for a while yet, this was not the case. Above all, my historian, this time, do not say there were no witnesses. There were many witnesses. Um, the, I'm going to read another poem in a similar sort of spirit from an earlier collection uh, called Update on the Descent. Um, this volume was published by Blood Axe Books, and it's called A Concise Biography of Tyranny. I, I don't know that it need, needs much explanation. Tyranny does not mind starting out small. It's indifferent to scale. Its dreams of grandeur are happily rehearsed in a child's theater. There, tyranny has a full set of tin soldiers with which to prepare the catastrophe. One wears a gas mask, another a metal helmet. Hidden in a drawer away from the others is the drummer whose head has been blown off. Tyranny has an awkward adolescence. It's all arms and legs and hot air. It talks of keeping the streets clean while it fills them with a litter of noise. Tyranny likes to have a hometown and a small cinema where its faithful can watch films in the evenings. Tyrannies learn slowly. It's only in young adulthood that they acquire the true benefits of decorum. Then they possess the ability to carry out their work like any proper business. In maturity, tyranny becomes a bona fide adult endowed with a fully grown body behind which it conceals a warehouse of regression. Tyranny's regression is simple, an infant's desire to impose its omnipotence on the world. Tyrannies are not good at aging. Tyrannies stay fit on a challenge. The thrill is lost when all the brave are dead. Tyranny in old age is never graceful. Surrounded by rusted cars and old foundries, it is a junk heap of promises. And as in Roman times, its successor was already, years ago, slain. The mystery is why one finds, time and again, flowers on its grave. Um, it was lovely to hear French at the beginning of this reading, and um, I, I was thinking about how a number of years ago I asked some French students I was teaching in a university in Paris to write about that great topic, democracy. And it was in fact the only exercise they refused to do. And I thought about that for a long time. Um, and I thought about how we have these big words um, which encapsulate so many of our hopes and as well as our failures. And they become so large um, that we almost become afraid of them. They become taboo. And it's almost as if we, if we don't mention those big words, those old words, we can escape them. And I started to think about some other old words like hope and justice. And so this, um, and there's a beautiful quote by the Czech playwright and dissident Václav Havel in which he says, Goodwill longs to be recognized and cultivated. For it to develop, it must hear that the world does not ridicule it. And I think this is where we are now, that there are some big and some old words 
that we need to adopt and to make ours again, um, like democracy and hope and justice. So um, the next poem is called Interdiction, and it's about the old words. It is said we can no longer use the old words. Either they carry in their script the imprint of our inhumanity, the memory of the naked bodies burned as the classical strains played, or contain their own blueprint of destruction, the way a seed harbors in its cells its final latent corruption. We have become afraid of them, the old words, as if at last we could escape punishment if, for once and for all, they were forbidden utterance in the public squares. As if we could walk out to where the river joins that final deep, where the tides plow and reap the untouchable air, there beyond boundaries, voices. Yet even where silence and the river sticks merge, there remain gestures that must be transcribed. And I have listened to your voice at sundown, breaking with grief, undone by the bludgeoning tool of the eternal sorrows, the way that Prime grieved, in the old words, the broken body of his son. And heads are still brought openly to the marketplace as if in triumph. The old words have blood on them, but here, under the blackened sun, there are things in the trammeled, the ruined, the old words, which must still be said. I, I think I'll end with um, the title poem from uh, The Illegal Age. And which, uh, which was written about six or seven years ago. And um, to return to the beginning of the reading, describes this sensation of this period that's approaching us, this darkness, but for a darkness for which we can resist and, and it hopes for a future that we can create as citizens, as free people. And um, so it's called the illegal age. You too have felt it, the imperceptible shift in latitude, the way the air resistedly parts before the iron wedge of storm. Later, you will recall you once sensed it in the instant of darkness before daybreak, before, for which we have no name. Do not think it has not been prepared. Do not think there are not those who are waiting. Later, you will remember the air smelled of precision. You will recollect how doubt wordlessly descended. Was it in those final moments when they were led down to the water before the terrible acts that you first suspected? You too will believe you are alone to perceive the tenebrous advance heralded, heralded by manacles. A way forward has been made for the hour without mercy. Later you will recall how each letter tightened in the throat, the tongue stammering into silence. Don't think your compliance is not being observed. Later you will realize that compromise is the wood that burns most brightly in the hour before regret. But by then, all the doors will have been marked in yellow chalk. Still, let us not pass each other this final time without recognition, without looking each other in the eye. Remember, in the ink light of testimony, a record may still be kept. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, there was so much fire in those words, fire I think we can all feel. And just what you said in your last introduction there, um, that we can resist 
and that there can be a future that we can create as free people. Uh, those are words that are going to stay with me. Um, so thanks very much to Julie Morrissey, to Musa Kanyile and to Ellen Hinsey for those three fantastic readings. Um, I'm going to ask some questions now. So this is, you know, a virtual Q&A. It's going to be a bit different than a real life one. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'll ask the first question and I'll call on each of you in the order in which you read to answer. And then for the next question, I might mix it up and call you in reverse order. So the same person isn't always answering first and we'll see how we go. So actually, uh, your reading, Ellen, kind of led me quite smoothly into the first question I have. Something I notice about all three of you is that you have gone to the trouble of learning new skills, specialist skills that help people, um, and but that you also continue to write poetry. And that's a journey I've been on myself. And I wanted to ask the question, uh, in what ways do you feel that poetry um, can help the world, that poetry can contribute to what we need in the world today? So Julie, if you want to answer that first. Sure, thanks, Cathy. Um, I mean, it's a really good question. Um, and I kind of go back a lot to, um, I mean, a lot of um, my research is looking at the ways that poetry maybe can contribute to forms of social engagement or social action. Um, and I've been looking particularly at um, book length poetry um, in a North American context. So people like C.D. Wright and Claudia Rankin and Emner Bessie Phillip. Um, and I think that I always go back to Lynn Higinian as well, um, as poetry as a kind of the language of inquiry. Um, so I think that it's a very, um, the kind of tunneling through that poetry allows you to do, uh, br bringing you into a kind of um, deep, thought and connection with issues and with people. Um, I think bringing those the two things together through poetry and also it's kind of, it's something that you, well, that I live through, um, it becomes part of my experience. And so my experience gets put into the poetry and it's very responsive in that sense. So I think mm -hmm. that's part of its strength. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. That was an excellent answer and loads of, um, authors who I would love to find out more about. Um, Mosa, what would you reckon? Um, for, for me, it's, uh, still trying to find ways, ways to, 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 to put this, but uh, I think what, what drove me to poetry is the, the power of healing. Uh, I know that people are now looking at poetry as uh, a way of, of, of healing trauma. Uh, so I work as a psychologist and uh, so that's um, the, the next project that I'll be working on will just be looking at how poetry, uh, the, the relationship between poetry and, and, and trauma. Uh, if 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 it does exist, uh, and of course we uh, we uh, in in South Africa right now we are on lockdown. And it's been a very difficult year, um, and uh, I found myself writing about. About about that, about how, for me, poetry has always helped me make sense of the world. And and and, and Julie mentioned uh, poetry being that that can be used as a vehicle for for engagement. Uh, and uh, so so for me, it's just it's just healing, the healing that can come from from poetry. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I really get that as regards, you know, how you speak when your voice has been taken away. For me, sometimes poetry is is the way to speak out of silence like that. Um, Ellen, what's your yeah. thinking on the question? I I, I agree with the, the poets, um, this evening's poets, I think, makes me think about um, Yeats talking about being heard into poetry and, and 
the po heard into poetry, but also poetry heals us, both things happening in, simultaneously. Um, I also think that the, the Russian poet, Joseph Brodsky talk about, talked about poetry being an accelerator of consciousness. And I think for the poet, um, there's something about the vehicle of poetry, which is a really free art. Um, it's mm. on the other side of rhetoric. It's something where it's much more, it's about perception, it's about the heart, it's about all these things fused together. And I think this allows, it, it's a space, it's a space of freedom. And, um, and I think this make it, makes it a very powerful art. Absolutely. Thanks very much. They're actually three quite different answers, but they wove together in, in a really lovely overall answer. Um, the second question I was going to ask then is a kind of more, it's, 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 it's a more lighthearted question maybe, or maybe not. Uh, I'm wondering if you could share um, a touchstone poem that you have. So a poem that has influenced you that you come back to again and again and why that is. So Ellen, if you'd like to answer that first. Um, well, there's so many poems, I think. Um, it depends on the period in one's life. Poems follow us. We discover them. They uh, become critical. Maybe lines of poems stand out. Um, uh, certainly poems like The Second Coming is very important. But I'd, I'd say, um, for me, probably the, the great poem by the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova, Requiem. Uh, which she wrote over a long period of time, and it could never be written down. And it was about the the Stalinist period. And this poem, which was written, and then she would recite it out loud to a couple of friends um, in a room, and then they would inscribe it on match paper, memorize it, and then the match paper would be burned. And I think that we can't, one can hardly find a more critical story about the need for poetry, poetry as witness, and, and also how it endures in, in the minds and memories of people. So I would say Requiem would be a, a really critical poem for me. Thank you. Um, that's a really, really lovely answer, and it kind of weaves into the, to the previous question as well. Um, Musa? Do you have a, a touchstone poem? Um, you know, uh, not really, but there are definitely poems that I always go back to. Uh, and for me, it's usually just just lines that, that you know, I, lines that um, I'm always thinking about, you know, lines that stand out uh, and, uh, uh, there was a time when I walked around with the um, Ocean Vong's line from from his from his poem uh, Notebook Fragments. Uh, it, it's in the his his collection Night Sky with Exit Wounds. Uh, so so for me it's, it's not. Uh, there was a time when I walked uh, around with a line uh, by Boris Singer, who was one of the South African poets. And there was a time when I walked around with Copas Movement's work, uh, line. So it's not usually the, 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 the whole poem, but it would be just those those parts from the poem and different parts. And yeah, so for me, that's, that's how it usually uh, goes, yeah. Nice. Yeah, that happens to me too with fragments or phrases that just you end up walking yeah. to the beat of them nearly. Thank you. And Julie, what, what do you think? Um, I think, you know, of course, there's so many poems that I think about a lot, but probably the one that I return to the most or maybe that has had the most influence on me is Ivan Bolin's The Black Lace Fan My Mother Gave Me. Um, it's a poem that I've been reading since I was 14, maybe, and I uh, studied it in school and it has just returned to me then um, as I started writing poetry myself. Um, and I always, I was really enthralled by studying poetry at school, uh, probably in a way that other people were not. <laughs> and, um, 
Yeah. <laughs> um, I used to learn the poems by heart because I, I was afraid that I would forget the lines when I was in the exam. So um, I would learn them all through. And, and that one was a particularly easy one for me to learn because I felt like it was very easy to enter in the way that Boland uses the object of the fan to kind of explore her parents' relationship and as this kind of tool of imagination for a time before she existed. Um, I think is is fantastic and I love the ending of it where she's talking about the blackbird on the first morning and the the span of the blackbird's wing and the fan I just it's one of those poems that every time I read it I think how did she do this nice thanks very much yeah that exact feeling in school is the reason I still know Yeats's second coming off by her <laughs> um, <laughs> I think we have time for one more question, if you guys are up for it. Uh, maybe a question about the craft. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of writers tuning in tonight. And I wonder if I could pick your brains a little bit about how you deal with uh, being blocked and the various horrific manifestations of writer's block. If you had any advice for the writers in the audience. Musa, I'll ask you first so everyone gets a chance to go first. <laughs> okay. Uh... It reminds me of what I once said to, um, I think it was Corpus or another writer that I've always been worried that uh, I would never make it. Well, I'm sorry, I don't know. But I've always been worried that. Uh, Looks like Musa has dropped his connection. We might move on to um, Julie. I'm trying to do. I'm trying to mix up the orders, and hopefully by the time you and Ellen have answered, uh, Musa will be able to come back. Sure, no problem. Um, I think for me, the most straightforward thing to do is when you're not, um, you know, when you're finding that difficulty with writing, um, where you feel like it won't come or or it's just tricky. Um, I read. I and I. That's the mm. my kind of fall back and once I start reading sometimes I'm really surprised at how immediate the writing is once I start reading um and so I think that's that's always what I would say to students is if you're stuck just start reading and also just to keep um some faith that it all it always comes back you know sometimes it goes for a week sometimes it goes for a month sometimes it's six months sometimes it's a year but it, it will <laughs> come back and if you stay engaged and you keep practicing I, I mean I think reading is part of the practice of writing so if you keep practicing in some form um it will return in my experience that's um that's what's happened <laughs> yeah I couldn't agree more and actually I think some you know when you get very blocked and you think oh maybe it's gone forever maybe I'm free and then you're like oh no no, no it's not gone <laughs> <laughs> Ellen do you have oh good Musa's back uh, I'll go to Ellen first, and then Musa, I'll come back to you, if that's okay. Ellen. Unless, unless Musa would like to finish where he was. In his yeah, question. in oh. case the connection goes again. Would you like to? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Don't worry. So I was saying that, yeah, so I was saying that for me, it's always been about patience. Uh, and sometimes I go for for days, sometimes uh, not for months, but for maybe for weeks without without writing anything. But I always think about. I'm always if I'm not writing, I'm always thinking about writing. If I'm not thinking about writing, then I'm reading, and uh, all of this is just it's part of the the writing process for me. Uh, and so uh, it, it's for me it's just it comes down to patience just um, uh, and, and just finding comfort in the fact that it 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 always because I've been writing since childhood uh, since since high school so it wouldn't make sense for me to then say oh my god what if I never write another poem again you know because I've been doing this for 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 a long time it's just it it doesn't it, it doesn't it wouldn't make sense. So it's just knowing that there are times when uh, poems do not come, 
but they will eventually come. So just finding comfort in that. And yeah, that's what I do. For me, it's just, it's just a matter of being patient. Yeah. Thank you. And I cannot tell you, I'm sure there are other poets are equally um, blown away by how similar your answer was to Julie's. You weren't here when she answered and you've almost said exactly the same thing. So if that's not proof oh. that this is good advice, <laughs> it's amazing, every aspect. So Ellen, I'll come, I'll come finally to you. Yeah, I think I, I have a slightly different take on it, although absolutely reading for sure, um, waiting. Um, I, I think I'm a bit old fashioned in this regard. And um, I'm not sure that we control creativity. I'm not sure that there isn't something that mysterious that gets mixed in. And in fact, that we're not supposed to, the will is not supposed to be the driving force. Um, inspiration, we don't know exactly where it comes from. So waiting, I think waiting is also, a lot of things happen in the waiting. We don't, that we're not aware of. We're gathering strength, we're, we're reflecting on things, we're having experiences. Um, and so I think this mysterious waiting, waiting, um, as Simone Weil would say, waiting for something to hit us. Um, but secondarily, I think that one thing that can be a block is that there's also self-editing. And I think sometimes part of us says, well, I can't write about that uh, for some reason. And um, our own authenticity. And I think that when we break through to our authenticity, um, there's a, there can be a great surge of creativity. So, but getting to that sense of freedom in our own creativity is a, a long journey. Mm, I agree. Thank you very much. I have to say, I've, I found tonight's reading uh, very inspiring and I feel very, yeah, just grateful and also excited about my own writing. So I'm sure the rest of the audience feels the same. So just want to say again to Julie Morrissey, Musa Kanyile and Ellen. And Hinzi, thank you so much for being with us from literally all over the world tonight. And thank you so much to all of our virtual audience. I hope you guys are going to tune into the other events and readings. And if you're feeling generous, I believe that the, let me see. Yeah, I believe that the donation box is up at the top of your screen. I can't see it, but I believe that it's there. So you might think about that. So thanks again, everyone, for being with us. Thanks, Julie, Musa, Ellen, um, and enjoy the rest of the festival. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.